we'll see if it happens again. All right, welcome to Math 21 499 Research. What we're going to talk about today is Zeckendorf problems. There are, let's see, four, eight, nine, ten, what, three? Okay, so we have double digits of people here. Absolutely fine. There are plenty of things you can look at. What I want to do is I want to start off with one really concrete problem that's bothered me for, what is it now, three years? Three years. Three years that I would love to be solved, or if not solved, at least used as a springboard to find something interesting. Then I'm going to talk about another paper that I have deliberately not thought about. And it was very hard because you know, I had that you know, 40 minute ride on the bus to get here, and I've got the paper on my iPad, and I know I can start reading. No, no. What I want to do is I want to leave some things for you to think about, and I want you to think what might be a good problem. Some of them are going to turn out to be impossible. Some of them are going to turn out to be trivial. And the goal is to try to find something between the two extremes. All right. So shall we start off with your problem? Sure. OK. So is everybody here familiar with the basics of Zeckendorf decompositions, that if you write the Fibonacci numbers, you know, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, you can write every number uniquely as a sum of non-adjacent Fibonacci's? I'm actually going to just try maybe moving this a little closer. I think it might get a little bit better the size. OK. OK, so everybody's comfortable with the basics of Zeckendorf decompositions. What I would love to do, welcome, welcome. Hello. You have to say name and year. Oh, I'm Daniel. I'm a freshman. OK. I'm Evan. I'm also a freshman. OK. I thought I heard more. OK. I thought I did, too. OK, it's just the voices in my head. Excellent. OK, so everybody's familiar with Zeckendorf decompositions. What I would love to do is generalize Zeckendorf in a fundamentally two-dimensional way. And there are a couple of different ways you can do this. Uh, how many of you have taken complex analysis? Okay, do I count? <laughs> I, I did figure it out. All right, so I, I will <laughs> answer the question the way uh, at the joint math meetings, I am what is known as an affiliated power of Pi Mu Epsilon, the Undergraduate Math Honor Society. I don't know if there's a Pi Mu Epsilon chapter on campus. So I am not allowed to vote at the council meetings, but I'm required to attend. And so I was arguing that I should be able to vote, just not have my vote counted. <laughs> <laughs> so you may speak, but it will not count for the purposes of the damage has been done. The damage has been done. <laughs> so if you know some complex analysis, this thing's called uh, fundamental domains for matrices acting on complex numbers. And you can use this to tile the upper half plane or tile the unit disk. They're very similar. And you can try to play Zeckendorf games with something like that. So this is a more geometric thing. If you're interested, I can give you some stuff to look at. But the whole point is to try to come up with a two-dimensional Zeckendorf problem. One thing is to try to look at recurrences maybe in two variables, you know, two indices, n and m. The Fibonacci is a recurrence relation with just one index. Is there a nice two-dimensional one? And can we somehow come up with a good rule for two-dimensional decompositions? So what Joshua was looking at, and there's a couple of ways you can choose to do it, was we were putting in numbers. So it goes off to infinity in these two directions. And you have a couple of ways of doing it. And he'll correct me if I get anything wrong. And the rule is you choose a bunch of these numbers to give you your decomposition. And the rule is you always have to be moving down and to the left to get your next summit. So you can never go to the right. That's just right out. You can't go up. That's up out. You can't go just down, and you can't go just left. You have to move in both directions. So for instance, this would be legal like that. But it would not be legal if I put in another circle over there. And you have a couple of different ways you can fill in the stuff over here. If you've seen the proof that the rationals are a countable set, you've got all these different ways you can snake through. Uh, I think we've been doing it diagonally. Yeah. So we've, been, we've yeah. been going along like this. And the rule is you add the smallest number which cannot be represented legally using what you have. So the first number, clear, has to be 1. Second number has to be 2. I can't do anything with 1 and 2, so I have to add a 3 here. 
I can't. You, you'll correct me if I make any mistakes. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Wait. No, you're good. Okay, okay. I was gonna say if, if I'm wrong this fast, it's not good. Now over here, I can't get four legally, so I have to put in a four. Well, you can't just do three and one. Right. Because. I can't do six. I can't do seven. Um, so I can't do five, so I have to put in a five here, correct? Now things finally get interesting. This is the first chance we actually have to do a legal jump. We can get six. And that's it. Can we get seven? No. So we have to add seven. All right, so let's keep going. I think we have to add eight. Any patterns look interesting? Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. Can we get nine? No. Can we get ten? No. Eleven? No. All these numbers are bad. So since we can't get nine, we have to put nine in. But now we have a chance of doing things interesting again. Can we get ten? Yes, we can get ten as nine and one. Can we get eleven? Nine and two. Can we get twelve? So I think twelve would be next. Now it's starting to get painful. We can get thirteen. Can we get 14? 14, nope. Um, I, I, I see 15. Can we get 14? Well, you don't have six anywhere, so that doesn't help matters. And so with the nine, if we want to use the nine, it's gonna be nine and two, not gonna be enough. 12 and three, too much. So I don't think we can get 14. We can get 15. Um, I don't think we can get 16, so. All right, is this enough to start conjecturing a pattern? Like the ex exorcity powers of two? Looking pretty good for powers of two down there, right? This is a lot of data points. Have I done this for you in lowest terms? I think you did. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you, don't, you don't cancel the sixes. Yeah. I can give you three fractions with that work. 16 over 64, 19 over 95, 49 over 98. They all work canceling anti-diagonally. But 12 over 24 is not one quarter. Just because something works for a while does not mean it will keep working. That said, the fact that I'm now all the way up to 16, that's looking pretty good. What about over here? What might you conjecture over here? Why 17? Nine plus eight. I'm sorry? Nine plus eight. Why are you doing nine plus eight? Um, okay, three and two is five, five and four is nine, nine and eight is. I was doing three plus two is five, then plus four, so maybe plus six. So both of them hopefully will be the same. And so we both are conjecturing. Well, the other one would be. Oh, okay. yeah. oh no, the other one will be different. Eight, you lost nine by two. Okay. So here I go, I add two, then I add four. So if I add six, I would get 15. And for your way, you would have 17. Yeah. Good. Good. So this is great that we have a conjecture from the holder of chalk, and we have a conjecture from the audience. Both of them can't be right. All right. So it all comes down to, is there a way to get 15 legally? Yeah. There is, and my conjecture now is destroyed. <laughs> right? Can we get 16? Yes. We put 16 down there. Can we get 17? So this is terrific. This was not planned. But it shows you the danger that a pattern could hold for a while and then break down. So maybe that's the pattern for how you get the next number. And then you can keep trying to play this game. And so in our paper, we came up with a way to count how many legal paths there are. And what made it very nice is because you have to move in both the downward and the leftward simultaneously, you had a nice way to break it down. If I want to have exactly k summons, I have k left steps and I have k down steps. So I want, say, L1 plus LK to equal N, and then D1 plus DK to equal N. So if you remember from the first Fibonacci lecture, I'm just looking at how many ways can I decompose N cookies among k distinct people twice, and then just multiply them. This is not the problem I wanted Joshua to study. I wanted him to say the problem where you could go just horizontally or just vertically as a legal move. 
And then that makes this much harder. So the first project, which I would love people to try to explore, is what happens if you allow the more general motion? Are you able to say anything about that, or does the combinatorics become too hard? So for me, a lot of these problems, they, they're springboard problems to see good mathematics. And a lot of times, we choose what to study based on what is mathematically tractable. This was more tractable motion. And we've generalized this to higher dimensions. The original proofs we had were very specific for one and two dimension, and they don't really extend nicely. So we have come up with a new backdoor proof, which. Um, well, what I was going to say is that the original proof we had come up with, like we took quite a while to write it up. That took a while, in part because I'm still learning in some sense. And then we realized that we were looking at the problem from the wrong perspective, and then it doesn't generalize well. And it took some help from some other students to um, get everything working in order. Uh, I'll say it was inspired by working with them. Fair enough. But th these were high school students that Joshua and I were mentoring. And you know, it turns out that all the analysis which worked really nicely in the two-dimensional case breaks down in the higher dimensional case. And we were just focusing on the wrong thing. And when we sucked back and we looked at it again, so first project is to try to do something with this. You know, related to this, there's a lot of different things you can look at. Can you try to come up with a good sequence, as I said, you know, AMN in some sense? Another thing you could do is you could put you know, one sequence AN down here and one sequence maybe BM up here. And maybe the entries over here is maybe it's A and BM. Can you somehow create a grid and have nice decomposition rules? Another thing is going back to the Fibonacci quilt that I had mentioned, you know, where it's spiraling outward. And you can't use two summons if they share a wall. So here it would be one, two, three, uh, four, five, uh, six is four plus two, seven, eight is three plus five, nine, I need to do 10 is 9 and 1. And in 11, I can get 9 and 2 and 7 and 4. So you very quickly learn that you lose uniqueness. And the question, of course, is over here, did we prove that you, you must have proved you lose uniqueness, right? We, did, we, we found an example. Yeah. I think it took a little longer, though. Yeah. And so the question is, how badly do you, you, do you lose uniqueness? And we were able to prove, uh, myself and some of my colleagues here, that the number of decompositions on average is actually growing exponentially. So there are lots of things you could try to do here. There's some other shapes that you can do, and I can give you some stuff to look at. But the goal is to get you to try new papers as fast as possible. You know, so look at some stuff, and then try to come up with something new, something interesting. Okay. Any questions on this? You can, of course, instead of going like this, you could have gone uh, here, and then we could have gone like this, in this kind of motion, does that change the problem fundamentally? Or are there other ways you can do things? All right. Any questions on this before I go on to the next second of item? Yes? So, yeah, like L1 all the way through like LK. Yes. Can you just speak more about that? Like sure. So what I want to do here is I want to say it takes me exactly K summons to get all the way down here. And whenever you're doing something on the board like this, you always go yeah, 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 for some of the technical details. So I, I want to basically have k things chosen. And so how do I get from here to here? I have to choose a distance to go left and a distance to go down. And so that'll be my L1 and then my D1. Uh -oh. And then over here, this will be my second one. So this will be my L2 and my V2. OK, so that's the first set of problems. Any other questions about this? And again, these are springboard problems. There's lots of ways you can go. Yes? Right. So rather than insisting on like uh, decomposition, like valid decomposition for all its shapes, right. uh, why not do something like the MSPB stuff and like see like with the linear machines or like some other like generation, mm -hmm. uh, what sums is it with like decomposition? So you're looking at all subsets of dots now, or? I don't know. So like if you just like generate like the grid with some other, I don't know, some other formula, and then look at the exchange rate sums 
or a missing valid decomposition that we're finding. So would you be taking the set and adding it to itself so you can only have pairs of things, or could you have right, multiple? Right. So rather than just do it, like iterating through the matching numbers, maybe just say, like, well, let's make the grid be like 1, 2, 4, 8, something like that. Or that, like, that that's, that's a good example, but maybe right. like something, I don't know. But I'm saying when, when you have the grid, are you adding the grid to itself, or are you just looking at all possible sums of things in the grid? Oh, so still something along the lines of like with a valid like path decomposition or like a simple path. Like you're saying so like in here like like right. one we don't have one and then we don't have two or we don't have two so we put two but instead right. of the three you next check if you get four and right. check if you get eight. Well, because if you do things legally, we will have every element represented right. by, by construction. Right, but that's a. But but so what you would say is instead put in a sequence of numbers and see what's missed. Right. Yeah. So. Ah. Uh, you maybe you cycle through the numbers one, two, three, four, or maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right, like something along. You know, absolutely fine to look at and see what numbers would you miss. The question is, would this become too arithmetically difficult in terms of which numbers are missed? So it's it's worth exploring, and you could even do some computer simulations and see which numbers do you get and which numbers do you not get. What I worry about is arithmetic is actually very hard. Probability is relatively easy compared to arithmetic. Combinatorics, I think, is easy compared to arithmetic. And so you could end up having a lot of difficulty based on where the numbers lie in terms of which things are representable or not. Also, if you just do, of course, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, every number is going to be hit. So you would need to take some kind of interesting sequence and put it in. Absolutely fine to try to explore something like that and see, can I come up with an interesting question based on this? And frequently, the first research question you ask is not the one you end up solving or the one you end up studying, but it's a way to stop the process. So if you can find interesting sequences to put in here and then look and see what's missing and how does that change as you grow things, go for it. It might be easy to have things growing in a square grid just you know, rather than having a more general shape. But sometimes you might say, well, what if I have my columns growing at the rate of n and my rows growing at the rate of, say, one fifth n. So they're growing at a similar scale, but not at the same constant rate. That might be large enough so that a lot of limiting behaviors happen. And I think we have some results like that for the Gaussian behaviors. Uh, other questions on this? So you have lots of things you can look at. So the next is I have not read too much about this one. This was the one on even Fibonacci decompositions. Did anybody take a look at that paper? Okay, so I think that defining the Fibonacci numbers this way. There's a Red Sox fan here one day. And so what you want to do is every number can be written as a sum of a k f two k, where a k is in 0, 1, 2. And I think there's some rules about if you have two numbers that are used with a 2, then there must be a number that's not used at all between them. I think there's some rules like this. So the first question is, do we believe that every number can be written as a sum of just even indexed Fibonacci's? Where you can use each number either 0, once, or twice. But we can clearly get 1. So let's, so if I have things right, these should be the even index Fibonacci's. So I can get one, I can double one and I can get two. If I want to get three, well I've got three. If I want to get four, I can get four. Five, three and two ones. Six would be two threes. Seven would be two threes and a one. Eight would be just an eight. So it's at least looking plausible that I can write every number as a sum like this. So the first question is, we do all of the work we've done for Zeckendorf decompositions now for these even Fibonacci decompositions. And then of course, what's going on with the odds? And then what about other recurrences? So 
I am not a card carrying member of the Fibonacci Association because we do not have cards, but I am one of the 12 members of the governing board of the Fibonacci numbers. Yes, there actually is a governing board internationally recognized. I am actually one of the people who is organizing the next conference. So we have them every two years. The next one will be in July 2020 at the University of Sarajevo. So if any of you are working on projects like this, there is the opportunity to present this. Uh, when the tape is not rolling, I will tell what happened the last time I took Carnegie Mellon students to an international Fibonacci conference. But that's a better story when the tape is not rolling. But so here, here's a decomposition. What's known about this? We have a lot of results about other decompositions. And we have rules that the distribution of the number of summons is Gaussian. We have rules about the gaps between summons. We have rules about the longest gap between summons. Can you prove results like this for the even Fibonaccis? What if we generalize the Fibonaccis to other occurrences? Is there something similar? And then the question becomes, which occurrences are the best generalizations? So what frequently happens is there are certain key properties and you may not know initially which is the one that really matters. So can somebody tell me the recurrence relation for the Fibonacci's? Inverse of the inverse minus one plus three times Okay, I'm going to use F. So each Fibonacci is the sum of the previous two. What do you think is the second simplest recurrence relation to look at? I think we would all agree Fn plus 1 equals Fn is really not worth our study. Sometimes I am a strong proponent of look at the most basic case and you build your intuition. A lot of times you try to start too big. Start small, build things up. Well, I'm sorry. Fn plus 1 equals Fn is too small to learn anything of use. But is this the simplest recurrence relation to look at? You know, Fn plus 1 is Fn plus Fn minus 1. I am not allowing Fn plus 1 equals Fn. That is too simple to be allowed. This is like the empty set. Is the empty set a vector space? Who remembers their linear algebra? <laughs> if you don't remember your linear algebra, what is your probability of getting it correct? Yes? A uh half. -huh. So do you want to go for it? Uh, yeah, it is. It is a vector space. It's a very bad, trivial vector space. And I remember my freshman uh, book, we did multivariable linear algebra, vector analysis, and some points of topology in a nice unified year-long course. And it had some comments. Note, because the empty set is a vector space, it screws up the statements of a lot of theorems. So we will tacitly exclude it whenever it causes trouble. <laughs> and so it's kind of nice to have vector spaces that have, oh, I don't know, objects. But there are some things that don't exist. And so you do need to allow the empty vector space. What is the simplest recurrence relation? Is this the simplest recurrence relation that's not completely stupid? Or is there something else that might be reasonable to study? Yeah. yeah. Add a constant. So one is adding a constant. Adding a constant. Um, doesn't make it simple at all. Constant's actually harder. You can get away with uh, removing the constant by changing variables sometimes. So there are tricks to get rid of a constant. But instead of having a recurrence relation like this, what could we do? What do you think might be a simpler recurrence than this? OK, so, so what would you the recurrence relation? A n plus 1 equals? So no, 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 no. That, 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 that scares me, because that's now nonlinear. So we have a of n times a of n minus 1. Now you've got things of very varying degrees. It's, it's a nightmare. You could also make it exponential, or just increase the number of times by 1. Or so one is to increase the number of times, but I want something simpler than this. So you could say 2 a n. Yeah. So I think, the, I think the other natural candidate is twice a n. I think both of these can have camps of followers, that we are the simplest of recurrences that aren't trivial. This gives you powers of two. This gives you the binary decompositions. This gives you the Fibonacci stuff. So then you can start to ask, 
which is the best way to generalize? Do I generalize by increasing the number of terms? Do I generalize by increasing the number here? Is the next generalization maybe you know, Cn is Cn plus Cn minus 1 plus Cn minus 2, where I just add one more term? Or maybe I keep it as two terms and just ignore the n minus 1. Oh, uh, it's no, tough to see. Yeah. So let me write it down though. Oh. It wasn't written at all. Okay. <laughs> so there's two different ways you could go. I could have three terms, or maybe I don't have the term in the middle. You could, of course, also have Cn minus 1 plus Cn minus 2 and skip the Cn term and just shift those two down. You have a lot of different things you can look at. And so you want to try to figure yeah. out, once I understand something, what's the next easiest thing to look at? And you go from there. So I think a great project would be trying to first reprove a lot of results for the even Fibonacci decompositions. There may be some papers I've written with students that might immediately yield something like this. And it's fine to look at those papers and use that. It's also fine to just try to explore it directly and just get a feel for what's going on. And then once you have that, then try to ask about generalizations. Is there something corresponding for odds? There are some papers, I think Hannah Alpert was the first one to make some real breakthroughs on signed Fibonacci decompositions, where you can use each Fibonacci number at most once, but you can either have it with a positive or a negative sign. And then there are rules that will still give you unique decompositions. But if you have two positive signs in a row, I think they have to be at least four or three apart and if it's two negatives, they have to be, or if it's opposite, you know, there's it was all, I'm sorry? It was convoluted. It's not, it's not horrible, but it, it, it's enough that I'm not memorizing it because I almost never use it. But there are decompositions like that. And so you can start trying to play these games and see how far can you push these techniques. So I've emailed some of you that paper. I think that paper's listed on the web page. If not, I can put it up there later. But I think that's very promising. Most of the paper is actually not devoted to this. It's devoted to something else. Um, I want to say it's on like discrepancy measures of sequences in 0, 1, or maybe 0, 1 uh, to the dth power, where you have some hypercube. But it does talk a little bit about these even Fibonacci decompositions. So I think that's another possible problem. All right. Any other questions about this? So again, a lot of it comes down to trying to figure out what sequences can you study well. And in all the work I've done, it becomes a nightmare if there is a gap. So if I had Cn plus 1 was Cn minus 1 plus Cn minus 2, that's much harder. It really makes a difference if the leading term is 1. The Fibonacci quilt that I showed you earlier was an example where the leading term over here was a 0. And that caused non-uniqueness, that caused a lot more representations. This is a great thing that has not really been studied sufficiently well. So a lot of it is the low-hanging fruit. There are certain fields that are just mined. You know, if you want to look in elementary number theory, good luck. You know, people have been looking at elementary number theory. We measured this in the thousands of years. It's going to be hard to find something. Uh, another way of putting this, I don't mean any offense to any of you, but if I had to bet on you or Gauss and Euler, my money's on Gauss and Euler. <laughs> and if it was me versus Gauss and Euler, I would still bet on Gauss and Euler. My study group my freshman year in math, uh, I don't know how this came up, but the discussion one day was, who would you rather have in the group, me or Euler? And they chose Euler. And when I reminded them that Euler's dead, <laughs> but it would be inspirational to have Euler's body. <laughs> So the last one that I want to start with is a set of problems that's joint with my colleague Ron Evans, who is the highest level of professor you can be. He's an emeritus professor. It means he gets to do what he wants without having to do the administrative meetings. We all aspire to reach that status one day. So it came from, uh, I think, a pool question. Anybody here play pool? Anybody play Cutthroat? Okay, because I have a Cutthroat question from a game I played against my two kids. And 
I was hoping that somebody in the audience would be able to answer a very challenging pool question, but right. So you have pool balls one, two, three, all the way up to 15. And you choose six, all choices equally likely. And the first question, what is the probability never choose three consecutive? So for instance, if I choose four, five, and eight, that's fine because I don't have three consecutive, but if I chose four, five, six, that would be three consecutive. The next question was probability never choose three consecutive and never miss three consecutive. So somewhat trying to balance between the two. And so we've been able to solve these problems. We have ugly answers involving sums of multinomial coefficients. And you, know, you can put them on a computer and the computer will calculate them. You could also just go brute force and enumerate. So you always want to get a sense of, is this tractable? This is Carnegie Mellon. I'm not at Williams now. Right? How many things do I need to explore if I want to look at choosing 6 from 15? How big of a space is this? Does this terrify you? How many subsets are, are there? Well, let's look at all subsets. How many subsets are there of just 1 to 15? Yeah, so the number of subsets, you know, forget about size 6, is 2 to the 15. That's 2 to the 10 to the 1.5. What's 2 to the 10? About 1,000. So that's about 10 cubed to the 1.5. This is 10 to the 4.5. Your calculators are probably good enough at this school to handle you know, something at this level, your phones. You know, I'm not worried about you know, 10 to the 4.5 things to check. You can easily brute force that. So for something like this initial problem, we can easily brute force it on a computer and check uh, combinatorial formulas and see if they match. But then what if you start to generalize? Rather than going up to 15, you go up to maybe big N. And rather than 6, you choose K. And now, what is the probability for these choices? And of course, what do you replace three with? Yeah, different letters. We now need to choose another letter, maybe C if it's consecutive. Or you can even have C1 and C2. They don't necessarily have to be the same. You know, there's lots of different ways you can push this. And what you could see is maybe each one of these corresponds to a legal choice. And so for each ball, I'll put a 0 or 1 in front of it. And so maybe I get some kind of string. And I might want to know, how many summons do I have? Well, if I tell you I choose k, it's pretty easy to calculate how many summons, right? This is not a challenge. How many summons are there? k. <laughs> so. We have to get rid of that. So now we just say, let's look at all the choices where we don't have um, C, oh, so this would be C1, that would be C2. So we look at all the choices where we don't have C1 consecutive um, and we don't have C2 consecutive missed. Now we can ask, how many summons do we have? How is that distributed? And you can try to ask various games and questions about this. And there's a lot of other things you can ask. This is meant to just be another you know, springboard type of problem. Is there a recurrence relation or something lurking in this? All right. Are there any things for a second? Or first of all, any things about this? What I hope you're noticing is a lot of these problems have a very tractable get your hands dirty component. 
where you can get on the computer very quickly and start generating tables, start generating data, and trying to sniff out relationships. Yes? Has any research been done in this specifically? Given that this problem is maybe two or three days old, oh, okay. I don't think much has been done about this yet, unless someone has come up with this idea independently and looked at this. I don't think so. And this is why, to some extent, it's always good to have your ears open when you talk to people. This is how you get your ideas. What do you know? What do I know? What, we, what can we join forces on? Uh, a lot of my Benefit stuff, oh no, the, the tape is rolling. Well I'll save that until we have the tape malfunction. Thank you, sorry. Two things on Benefit. So in a lot of these problems, do you first do a literature review or do you first try to do some calculations yourself? I would say you should do the calculations first yourself. If you start reading the literature, there's the danger of having blinders and following what other people are doing. Right now, I don't think anybody's life is going to end if they don't get a research paper out of this. That is not what the purpose of this class is. If that happens, that's wonderful. But the goal is for you to learn research methods. The goal is to learn how to read papers. The goal is to learn how to write papers. The goal is to learn how to present papers. Uh, in case anybody is under the assumption that a good way to present a paper at a talk is to actually project the paper and scroll through it, I will just answer right now that no, that is not a good way to present <laughs> a paper at a talk. And I have seen that numerous times. So have I. Yes. It's very hard to do that well. If you have maybe a two page presentation perhaps, where the second one is thank you. Um, <laughs> but the goal is really, this is the teach you how to fish. And so if you spend a lot of time, that's going to be valuable use of your time. And that's why spend some time and bang your head. Also, if you start reading the literature, it is going to force which direction you go down. Be free. Look at these questions and say, huh. Where can I go with this? What else does it look at? This is one of the reasons why a lot of departments have daily tea, or maybe tea the day of sun, because they want people to be in the same room talking to each other. And that's how a lot of progress is made, is, oh, hey, and maybe you could help me with this, or I'm stuck on this. When I was at Brown, um, I never wrote a paper with Mike Rosen, but he was just a wonderful person to have in the department, not just because you know, he rooted for the same teams I did, but because he was a general number theorist. And if you had a question about number theory, he would know references, and he would know things to look at. All right, any other questions on this stuff here? All right, I'm gonna hit stop it on this.